Hi, welcome to the etiology of periodontal diseases. First thing we'll be talking about is the mouth of the fetus. It is not sterile at birth because it acquires the organism from the mother's vagina when it passes through the birth canal. Although the mouth was sterile when the fetus was inside uterus. And within the hours of birth, the aerobic and facultative organisms, they colonize the oral cavity and anaerobic organism, they colonize the oral cavity as early as second day. But one point to be noted is the major change in the composition of microorganism, they happen when the first tooth erupts in the oral cavity. Because with the tooth eruption, what we get is the subgingival environment and this subgingival environment is very favorable for anaerobic organisms. So it is when the first tooth erupts in the oral cavity, the main composition shifts towards the anaerobias. There are more than 500 different species that can colonize an adult mouth and one single individual can have more than 115 different species. And the five areas where the microorganism colonize are the intraoral supragingival heart surfaces that is teeth and implant. Then we have the pocket, it could be periodontal or peri-implant pocket. We have the epithelial surfaces, we have the dorsum of the tongue and we have the tonsils. But, but amongst all these niche, teeth and implant, they are unique because they do not have shedding surfaces. Now when we talk about an epithelium, even if a lot of bacteria, they colonize the surface of the epithelium, the epithelium has a tendency of shedding, shedding the epithelial cell because it is in a constant turnover. When it sheds the cells, a lot of bacteria that occupy the surface, they are also shed along with these cells. And this is one of the defense mechanism, how epithelial acts against the bacterial invasion. But when we talk about teeth or when we talk about implant, their surfaces are non-shedding. So once the bacteria colonize, they remain on the surface until they are mechanically removed. One more important point is these teeth and implants, they cause a natural breach in the epithelium. So normally the intact epithelium, it is broken down by the teeth and this breach in the epithelium makes these areas more susceptible to the bacterial attack. So these are the two unique features of uh, you know teeth and implant or heart tissues you can say. They have non-shedding surface and they have unique ectodermal interruptions. Most of the species of organism, they colonize all the five niches which we are talking about, but except spirochetes. And there are some karyogenic species that are restricted only to the heart tissue and they are called as obligate periphytes. Okay. This is an MCQ here. Next we come to dental plaque. What is dental plaque? It is a yellow gray substance that adheres to the tooth tenaciously. But main composition, the main component of the dental plaque is nothing but bacteria and one gram of dental plaque, it contains approximately 10 raised to the power 11 bacteria. And you have MCQ here. We have few more numbers here. We have supragingival plaque on a single tooth has more than 10 raised to the power 9 and in a pocket we have 10 to the power 3 to 10 raised to the power Eight bacteria. Now when we classify plaque, depending on its location, plaque can be classified as supragingival, that is above the gingival margin and we have intragingival, that is below the gingival margin. Now this supragingival plaque, the part of the supragingival plaque which is very close to the gingival margin, it is called as the marginal plaque. This marginal plaque is important in causing gingival inflammation. Then when we talk about the layers of the plaque, we have one inner layer of the plaque which is very close to the tooth structure which is called as tooth associated plaque and then we have the outer layer of the plaque which is very close to the tissues so it is called as tissue associated plaque. Now when we know the different types of plaque depending on their site specificness, the marginal plaque which we are talking about is the one which is important in development of gingivitis. The supragingival and tooth associated plaque is important in calculus formation and in root caries while tissue associated subgingival plaque it is associated with tissue destruction in periodontitis. So all these points are important.
Next we come to Materia alba. Materia alba is a soft accumulation of bacterial and tissue cells that lack organized structure. The point that is important here is although they have bacteria, they have tissue cells but they lack organized structures right? and they can be easily displaced by water. The main thing which we saw about plaque was that plaque was tenacious. And second thing we saw about plaque was, plaque was organized. These two points are lacking in materia alba. Now when we say about calculus, calculus it is nothing but the mineralized dentary plaque. Next we come to the structure of plaque. Plaque is considered as biofilm. What is a biofilm? Biofilm is a... Uh, it's a recently introduced concept not only seen on tooth, it is seen on any hard tissue structure which is you know exposed to moist environment. Example, it is seen in the pipe pipelines, you know, water pipelines, and uh, it is seen in you know inside the sea, any hard tissues can have a layer of biofilm on them. And this biofilm basically what it contains is of fluid filled channels and they have the cell and they have the matrix. The cells are nothing but the living cells, the bacteria, they are usually the bacteria and the matrix it, com it is composed of lipids, glycoprotein, albumin, pulsebrine. This is the matrix typical of plaque on the tooth and lipid they are derived from the cells and the membrane. So the lipids are derived from the cell membranes. And glycoprotein, it is from, derived from the salivary pellicle. We'll talk about the salivary pellicle very soon when we talk about the plaque formation. Albumin, it is derived from GCF. And polysaccharides, that is dextrons, which are mainly produced by bacteria. And this is a substance which has a major role in maintaining the integrity of biofilm. This is important here. Then... When we talk about the inorganic content, we have the calcium and phosphate. There are some traces of sodium, potassium, fluoride. And the fluoride is mainly derived from the external sources. This point is again important. This is MCQ here. So, when we talk about MCQs, we have, you know, biofilm. We have MCQs here. And we have MCQ, especially this fluoride. Next, we come to the formation of plaque. The first step in the formation of plaque is formation of pellicle. Pellicle is nothing but uh, selective glycoproteins from saliva. So you have a pool of saliva, right, from which some of the glycoproteins they adsorb on the surface, and this is pellicle. But the point important is selective. Not all glycoprotein, but few of the salivary glycoprotein they selectively absorb. Is, you know, forming salivary pellicle. Pellicle is very essential for the formation of plaque and without pellicle we cannot have plaque. After the pellicle is formed, the adhesion and attachment of bacteria start. The first initial stages, it is, you know, the transport of bacteria. You can say bacteria, they are moving randomly. While moving randomly, they come in contact with the surface, right? This is like they move with Brownian motion. Brownian motion, you know, they are just a haphazard motion like this. And while moving, they come in contact with the pellicle. After that, when they come in contact with the pellicle, few of them, they are attached to the surface, to the pellicle by weak forces, that is, van der Waals forces. After this, after the first attachment, the firm anchorage happens between the bacteria and the surface and this is by formation of the covalent or the ionic or the hydrogen bonds and later there is maturation. Next stage is the maturation of the plaque. The first colonizers are usually the streptococci and the actinomycosis. This point is important. So what we have MCQs here in this slide is the initial attachment. We have this van der Waals forces, right? Then the secondary attachment by covalent bonds. And after that, the first initial colonizers, we have this streptococci and we have actinomycosis. So next, I come to the secondary colonizers. Once we have the 
preliminary colonizers after that these are the secondary colonizers these colonizers typical about these colonizers is that they cannot adhere to pellicle directly they need the bacterial cell to which they can adhere so you had the pellicle you had the bacterial cells now these secondary colonizers they'll come and attack two bacterial cells not to the pellicle directly so these are the secondary colonizers Okay, because of the formation of these secondary colonizers or arrangement of these col secondary colonizers, we get two types of structures. One is concave appearance. Here, and you know, the streptococci they adhere to the filamentous bacteria. So you have the actinomyces, and on the top of it, we have so lots of streptococci. They adhering since the streptococci are round. What structure we get is a concave structure. There is one more structure called as test tube brush in this we have the small we have the rod shaped bacteria and to this we have the filamentous bacteria that adhere as secondary colonizer and this is called as test tube brush appearance you can make a note of it test tube brush appearance next when we say we have the initial colonizers and we have secondary colonizers point that is important is the early colonizers they help in attachment of the secondary colonizers what happens the early colonizers they make the environment more favorable for the growth of anaerobic bacteria so early colonizers they are they have two points they use oxygen and second they use sugar right since the use of oxygen the environment that becomes is anaerobic and since the use of sugar the next organism which are coming they do not have sugar for their nutrition so these early colonizers the use of the oxygen they make the environment anaerobic and they are saccharolytic that is they use sugar for the nutrition and they use up all the sugar so the next colonizers they they do not get sugar they do not get so they are usually anaerobic and they are proteolytic proteolytic that is they use protein for their nutrition right. and there is some more interplay you can say you have actinomyces and streptococcus which are the initial colonizers they form this lactate which is used by villonella and it forms formate which is used by campylobacter and one very common thing is the requirement of p gingivalis it is satisfied by you know we have villonella producing minadion we have campylobacter producing protoheme we have capnocytophaga acrecia producing succinate just add up add up this point in your keynotes so we just go back again so we have velonella producing minadion campylobacter producing protoheme and capnocytophaga acrecia produces succinate for p gingivalis so these are the bacterial derived factors which help p gingivalis so we have minadion we have protohin and third we have succinate so these are the three factors which are derived from other bacteria and they are used by p gingivalis for flourishing now p gingivalis also uh, uses a factor which is derived from host that is heme or hemin right so this factor is derived from host. from where this factor comes this factor basically comes from blood so you can say it's a just a vicious cycle now uh, when we say vicious cycle we'll just uh, see how it happens we have the initial colonizers or bacteria whatever colonize the oral cavity because of these bacteria what we get is inflammation because of the inflammation we have bleeding on probing we have bleeding there we have hem in and this bleeding on probing further favors the colonization of pg so you can say this is how indirectly you know via host one type of bacteria they help another type of bacteria we have one more point to be noted in this slide that is p intermedia if you see p intermedia uses steroids from host these steroids you know they could be sex hormones and that is the reason why p intermedia is a male organism that colonizes or that is responsible for puberty induced gingivitis and 
प्रेगनेंसी ड्यूस चिलचेटस ऑल दिस इज समराइज ओवर हियर सो वी सी हियर वी हैव दिस इनिशियल कॉलोनाइजर्स दे आर ग्राम पॉजिटिव दे आर मोस्टली इधर एरोबिक और फैकल्टेटिव एनोरोबिक वट इज फैकल्टेटिव एनोरोबिक फैकल्टेटिव एनोरोबिक आर नथिंग बट एनोरोबिक विच कैन लिव इन एरोबिक एज वेल एज एनोरोबिक एनवायरमेंट एंड लेट कॉलोनाइजर्स दे आर एनोरोबिक यू वी गेट द लेट कॉलोनाइजर्स सॉरी दिस इज द टूथ साइड एंड दिस इज द टिश्यू साइड so this side first the initial colonizer they use up all the sugar from saliva and the food after that the late colonizers they come very close to the tissue here in you know this is the gingiva and they use the proteins that comes from gcf for their nutrition supplies supply now we have the bacterial complexes this concept was given by sokransky in 1998 this concept is applicable only to chronic periodontitis because when when sokransky had done this study he had not considered aggressive periodontitis cases right so what he did was he studied the prevalence of organisms in the deceased people in healthy people and depending on that he classified them into various groups he divided into yellow complex that includes all the streptococci purple complex that includes v parvillae and actinomyces so yellow and purple if you remember the streptococci and actinomyces they are the early colonizers then we have the red complex red complex are the one which are mainly associated with disease in this we have p gingivalis t forsythensis and t denticola all three names are important and are asked in mcq then we have orange complex here orange complex is also associated with disease but the main causative organism are these red complex green complex which were not very commonly found associated if you see here you have this aa here so just now we saw the early colonizers are yellow and purple complex red complex is the one which is also associated with bleeding on probing next we talk about the rate of plaque formation rate of plaque formation when the plaque starts forming it is not so fast in first 24 hours although it increases very rapidly for the next 3 days and after a certain period of time you know it does not increase much why that happens we'll see probably later but we have one question here during the night what happens to the plaque growth is it reduced or is it increased During the night, plaque growth is reduced by fifty percent. Why? Because supragingival plaque it obtains most of its nutrition from saliva, and saliva is decreased during sleep. Now, since saliva is not there, we don't have nutrition, and that is why we have less plaque. So it is like sleep decreases saliva, that decreases nutrition. and that decreases plaque next we talk about the roughness if you have a rough surface there is more plaque as simple as that but there is something called as threshold threshold of 0.2 micrometers now if you try to smooth in this surface you know if you smooth this surface to a certain degree you will be able to reduce the plaque formation but after that there would be not much of a difference and that threshold is 0.2 micrometer and you know so above 0.2 micrometer plaque formation is increased but smoothing below 0.2 micrometer will not decrease plaque formation further and there is also individual variation in plaque formation you can see some of the people they have less plaque formation some of them have more plaque formation this could be explained by wettability of the tooth surface saliva induced aggregation or even there may be some salivary differences in these individual as relative salivary flow may be one of the reason why it causes individual variation in the plaque to all these points we you know we have summarization of few more facts we have lower jaw it has more plaque formation as compared to upper jaw molars they have more plaque than incisors buccal side 
has more plaque than the lingual side and interdental region will of course have more plaque as compared to the buccal and lingual areas hemin it favors p gingivalis growth we have alpha globulin it favors treponema growth and steroid hormone that favors p intermedia what is biofilm we had a word about biofilm before but here we see what is biofilm biofilm is basically bacteria in colonies are biofilm what do we mean by that we come to this diagram over here you see what happens initially there is attachment of preliminary bacteria here after that the secondary bacteria they come and attach they start growing they develop some kind of matrix around them and slowly this matrix also grows with them and they form this structure which is called as biofilm what is typical of the biofilm if you see here these biofilm they have some channels through which the fluid can pass so they form something like colonies and they have these channels here through which the water these are called as water channels and through this the nutrition passes and the waste products are carried out so this is a colony whenever the plaque grows you know more there is shedding these bacteria they come in colonies they try to help each other for example there is a bacteria here there are few other bacteria here this bacteria this thick bacteria it is penicillin resistant bacteria but these bacteria which are surrounding it they are not penicillin resistant if we give penicillin this bacteria will produce penicillin a or something that degrades penicillin and these small bacteria which were actually not resistant to penicillin they become resistant to penicillin just because they are in vicinity of this bacteria that protects them that is how biofilm acts so one bacteria protects another bacteria this one thing probably one bacteria produces a waste product which can be useful for another bacteria but one point is there because of lots of bacteria being there in a very small place these bacteria they have a very slow rate of growth so you can will you take it as a negative point slow rate of growth but because of the slow rate of growth they are very resistant to antibiotics we very well know antibiotics they act better on organisms which are dividing this biofilm organisms they have a very slow rate of growth so that is why they are resistant to it how does biofilm they communicate with each other biofilm they communicate with each other with a process called as quorum sensing now uh, i tell you actually they communicate with each other by bacterial communicating method conjugation transduction etc but biofilm they have one more typical method they communicate by quorum sensing what is quorum sensing quorum is we take an uh, example of a meeting this is a meeting hall and this is the chairperson and we are waiting you know we have invited around 20 people in the meeting and we have decided a quorum of eight people for a meeting to be conducted what does that mean that means that we need at least 8 people to be present for a meeting to happen if we don't have 8 people we will cancel the meeting so that is the word from where the quorum word is designed now what is quorum sensing how is quorum sensing we have a bacteria it produces some signals these signals are weak signals and you know they are not sensed by another bacteria it needs a real lot of signal there is one more bacteria one more bacteria and one more bacteria there may be few you know group of bacteria that produce the same signal and because many bacteria producing the signal the concentration increases and this concentrated signal can be sensed by next bacteria that is what is quorum we need a minimum quorum of bacteria to produce a signal that is sensed forth so that is called as quorum sensing this question was asked in comment k i think so it was in this year i mean just the last year what do you call it 2010 comment k and um, Next, we come to one more concept regarding bacteria. Bacteria they can translocate and they can transfer. How? 
we have a person we have another person the bacteria can be translocated from one person to another how probably by a handshake probably by sharing toothbrush but usually this translocation is not so significant because you know uh, a bacteria which caused disease in one individual that bacteria when it goes to another individual the host factor of or host defense factors of this individual they are able to stop this bacteria causing disease in another but imagine a scenario you have an arch okay you have your teeth here and what you do is you do a scaling this is an individual who has periodontal disease and what you do is you do a scaling in this region what you do is you do scaling in this area and you send the patient for a week you call after another week and what you do is you do scaling in this area in that particular week whatever scaling you had done here these bacteria they have tendency they can go and colonize this area again so whatever scaling you had done is a waste i don't say it would be a total waste but yes there was a waste of this because of this concept and now here you know this is a mouth of the same individual so you don't have this protection factor he was already susceptible to the same bacteria which he had in his mouth and this bacteria they colonize back again so what we may get is the decreased effect of this ava non surgical periodontal therapy so so because of this we came across a concept of one stage single stage full mouth disinfection this concept was given by quern et al in 1995 and this concept was based on the fact of bacterial translocation and cross infection this was an mcq in 2009 all right so i want you to know this thing very clearly so what is done in this one stage full mouth we do a full mouth scaling and root planing within 24 hours there is subgingival irrigation of 1% chlorhexidine gel tongue brushing with antiseptic and mites we are trying to remove all the bacteria from all the possible niche area so what we get is a real clean mouth and we are not expecting any bacterial translocation next we come to micro microorganism which are associated with specific diseases these three organisms which are very important these are the protective organisms we have a sanguis velonella parvale and c acrecia these organism they are the protective organism and a sanguis it's typically protected produces h2o2 and this h2o2 is lethal to ae so you can say it protects against ae then we have you know some diseases wherein we have key pathogens we have, we had already been talking about pregnancy gingivitis b p intermedia because of steroids we have smokers here smokers typically they have t forsythia t forsythensis one very important point about t forsythensis if you take a non smoker with 6 mm pocket and you take another smoker with 6 mm pocket right you won't find much difference in the microbial composition but if we take a smoker with 4 mm pocket and you take a non smoker with 4 mm pocket the smoker with 4 mm pocket will show more of t for cythia what does that mean in smokers t for cythensis can colonize even the shallower pockets that is the point here so difference in the flora from non smokers is more in shallow pockets then we had localized aggressive caused by aa and necrotizing caused by p intermedia and spirochetes now when we talk about the characteristic of periopathogens we have uh, aa that forms star shaped colonies and it typically ca uh, causes a footprint if you try to pick up these colonies of this it leaves footprints here then we have gray back colonies by c rectus and brown and dark brown colonies by p gingivalis because it is a one pigment producing bacteria with this we come to the end of this part thank you